everyone. I welcome you to the CEC lecture series. I am Nupur Chavla, teaching English literature at Maitri College, Delhi University. And in today's lecture, we are going to talk about the British drama in 20th century and take an overview of what were its concerns, what were the kinds of plays that were being written at this time, what were the themes and uh, different forms that one can uh, notice uh, at this time. In the previous lecture, uh, we had looked at uh, two broad categories and we had said that you know there were two kinds of plays that were being written. One were the theatre of the ideas and there were those uh, uh, plays which, uh, uh, which were written for entertainment. But then um, I mentioned that we are going to further uh, nuance this understanding and introduce other categories also that we notice uh, in drama at uh, this point of time which is 20th century. Okay? So uh, we will. Uh, so the first kind, as I said, was political. Uh, the second kind of uh, plays that one can see um, uh, are are indicated by the term theatre of the absurd, and then uh, we also, uh, you know, witnessed um, Irish drama, and there was a particular, uh, you know, uh, feature of political of, of of Irish drama, and why we consider it as part of English theatre. Right? So, these three things are going to be in discussion in today's lecture, in this lecture. Uh, talking about the first form, that is the political theatre, right? or as we have called it, the theatre of ideas. Now, what was this theatre doing? It posed questions about the social order, okay? questions about the, uh, the, the notion of power, questions about maybe the administration question about, um, let's say, women's position in society, questions about uh, the experience of the workers with the factory owners or the capitalists, right? So all these concerns uh, made way into uh, theatre. As playwrights were thinking about them and uh, they uh, dramatised these situations, these themes from real life and they uh, represented them in the form of plays, all right. Now we say that uh, you know associated with uh, this particular uh, uh, style of writing was the idea of a social realism. Okay. Uh, now why do we call it uh, social realism? Uh, because uh, these plays represented, uh, you know, a lot of times also a harsh picture of poverty and the impact of a capitalist formation. Okay, um, because they looked at uh, how a particular kind of a economic uh, formation in society was impacting people's daily life, was impacting uh, uh, you know uh, workers who were directly part of the system. Then uh, they also talked about the dwindling social and human values. Okay, uh, so these aspects tell us that there was a kind of a social realism that one uh, notices in this. Um, uh, uh, style of writing. Now, of course, the word social realism is uh, is technical. It is particular. Um, we see a lot of Marxist uh, uh, scholars and thinkers use this. I would urge you to uh, look it up further. But in this case, when we use the term, we say that uh, we are we are using it in the sense that uh, to indicate that how political theater then, uh, you know, uh, engaged with these themes uh, uh, in a realistic manner. They did not romanticize reality, they did not idealize reality, instead they looked at it with a critical eye, they examined the present and they also to an extent uh, you know have, uh, 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 they, they, they also had an eye on the future. That where is the current scenario headed, where are we or, or, or what direction are we moving towards. So all these were uh, uh, you know, the motivations or the intentions of um, the theatre of ideas. Uh, now, as I was also establishing in the previous lecture that, you know, drama in the 20th century had very clear um, uh, connections with, uh, uh, with its European counterparts, right? Uh, so, therefore, when we talk about a theatre of ideas in uh, the British uh, uh, context, we cannot but mention the influence of the German playwright Bertolt Brecht. Now, Brecht uh, wrote this, these particular kind of uh, plays, uh, uh, and in fact, uh, that's uh, very popularly 
called as epic theatre, right? Now, uh, what were the uh, features of epic theatre? Basically, uh, you know, uh, the foremost was the alienation effect, which you would have, you, you might have also come across this term alienation effect. Uh, that was uh, used by Bertolt Brecht, particularly in his plays, and then that became one of the decisive features of uh, epic theatre. Alienation effect is, uh, uh, you know, whereby uh, the play, uh, uh, you know, uh, alienates the audience from the processes of the, uh, uh, from, uh, from the dramatic action. So they uh, do not let the audience be so consumed by emotion. Uh, it's like a constant reminder. The play, the way it is written, uh, you know, there will be there will be gaps, there will be breaks in between, there will be songs, etc. All these, uh, uh, you know, uh, tropes or, 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 or all these methods are deliberately used in order to break this kind of, uh, uh, you know, spell, so to say, that an audience uh, might be into and to remind them that they are watching a play, right? So, it's like they, uh, they have to be alienated from the performance so that they do not uh, you know, get consumed emotionally and uh, and lose their sense of critical insight. So the so the idea of uh, 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 this alienation effect was to make people think, right? To to ensure that they do not just get swayed by emotion, they they do not get um, uh, you know uh, so consumed uh, 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 you know uh, uh, through their senses about whatever is going on, but instead they think. So, what is the way to make them think? By telling them that it's a play, it's a play which is raising some questions, right? So, which then keeps their critical faculty alive, where the audience then uh, has their mind in it instead of just being emotionally involved, right? So, very clearly, the moment a play makes you think, the moment a play wants to make you question, and the moment a play is constructed in this way, which is uh, one of the uh, uh, methods that are followed by epic theatre, we know that it is a theatre of ideas, right? So, we see that what Bertolt Brecht was doing, uh, he was the kind of themes that he was dealing with, um, all this had influenced uh, even uh, a drama in Britain, right? Um, and George Bernard Shaw is one of the foremost names that comes to mind when we think of political theatre in England in 20th century. Right? He has written multiple plays. Um, I would urge you to uh, uh, read them. Uh, they are incredibly witty. He is a master of wit. But at the same time, he makes some very important um, uh, you know, points. There are ideas that you notice. Uh, there are perspectives that he shares. Okay? So, this is then the one kind of um, uh, writing or one kind of place that we notice in the 20th century drama. Uh, the second kind is what we call as the theatre of the absurd or the, or the second form of drama is the theatre of the absurd. Okay? Now, um, when we look at the word absurd, absurd means something which is weird, something which is out of the ordinary, right? something which, uh, which sometimes even does not make sense. Okay? So, uh, this was definitely also uh, the feature of these kind of plays that were being written and uh, particularly these kind of uh, uh, plays uh, uh, were written in the, around 1950s and 60s okay that's the time when uh, this uh, this kind of writing uh, came into being and also flourished okay now what was the purpose or what were the features of the theater of the absurd we will look at it uh, in conjunction with uh, these two very important quotations by this French playwright Eugene Ionesco. Now, Ionesco is also associated with the theatre of the absurd, and he, um, uh, you know, um, comments upon uh, uh, not just this uh, uh, form, but he actually uh, comments upon the human condition at this time and the kind of plays then that were inspired by this human condition. So, let's look at the first quotation. He says, uh, cut off from his religious, metaph uh, uh, metaphysical and transcendental roots, man is lost, unquote. Now, what is he saying here? He is talking about the predicament of man around the 1950s and the 1960s, which is what? Towards the end, sorry, towards the middle 
uh, of uh, the 20th century. So, cut off from his religious, metaphysical and transcendental roots, man is lost. <clears throat> how, now the first question that you will ask, how was the man cut off from his religious roots? Because with the wars, with the kind of uh, extreme, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, devastation that one saw, people lost faith in the existence of God. Religions seemed to be nothing but just, uh, uh, you know, some institutions that made that that no longer made sense. People's faith in God got shaken up, right? Uh, so. The man became cut off from roots. Now you see, religion is a very important part, apparently, of uh, people's lives because it gives them hope, because it uh, it it helps them make sense of life. But uh, but when uh, religion is uh, called to question, right? Because you see, around this time, um, uh, in the in, in the beginning of the twentieth century, when modernism was uh, at its peak, uh, it was a time when everything was being questioned, right? Even, uh, you know, once um, uh, uh, one of the scientists established that how uh, Earth is not the center of the universe, but instead it's the sun that's the center of the universe. So there was a big change. This was a, like a big, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, invention. I mean, not, not, not really an invention, but a, but a big uh, uh, thought uh, which came into being, which had reversed the previous understanding. So this was a time when old beliefs were being questioned left, right and center right be it in science be it in society be it in art so it was the new that was making its way and the traditional was being questioned right so likewise even the question of religion then uh, seemed to uh, come uh, seemed to have come under scanner and uh, where uh, particularly uh, you know when we when we talk about the theater of the absurd the the reference is that how the wars had made uh, you know, existence come across as something which is very bizarre. Religion ha made no sense. Uh, man was completely cut off from any of these ideas, uh, which in, uh, which initially had helped him to make sense of life, and therefore man felt lost. Okay, so this is one predicament which Ionesco talks about of 20th century man. Now look at the uh, next quotation which he says. It says, "People drowning in meaninglessness." can only be grotesque. Their sufferings can only appear tragic by derision." Unquote. Now here, after having uh, you know, described the predicament of man, he says that people were drowning in meaninglessness. Again, meaninglessness, why? So much was going on around, they could not make sense of why such a widespread destruction. So it was just a moment of meaninglessness. They did not know, they did not have anything substantial to hold on to. Old values now seemed to be, um, like, you know, no longer useful. Okay, so he said that people were drowning in meaninglessness, and can so uh, peop, when uh, when this is the situation, this thing can only be represented by the grotesque. Grotesque means something which is, um, you know, unformed something which is uh, uh, very weird looking. So he said that this condition of man could only be articulated in the most grotesque manner. So it is just the representation of or the, or the grotesque representation that could carry the essence of this kind of a meaninglessness being uh, faced by people at this time. And their sufferings can only appear tragic by derision. Now, whatever uh, uh, you know, uh, people were going through at this time, they were suffering because of the wars, could appear tragic by derision. So, now the second word, important word is derision. Derision means, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, to, to basically uh, make, make fun of something and to uh, uh, cause laughter because of it, right? So, he says that uh, the sufferings could, be, could appear tragic. Uh, only when one would, uh, you know, kind of laugh at them, right? So, uh, these plays then, or uh, the theatre of the absurd, uh, uh, brought to the fore this kind of a meaninglessness uh, that was, uh, uh, you know, a predominant uh, uh, in uh, uh, 20th century and also it could only be represented uh, through, uh, you know, the grotesque and through this means whereby um, one would make fun of it, right? 
uh, through, uh, let's say, slapstick, through, let's say, uh, forms that would make you laugh, right? But what we need to see is that there's always a very thin line in the absurd uh, or in the theater of the absurd between, uh, uh, between uh, you know, um, uh, fun, wit and the tragic, very thin line. Sometimes you are not able to even make uh, uh, out one from the other, okay? But this is the uh, aspect of this kind of writing. Now, uh, some common themes at this time uh, which, were, uh, which were explored by the theater of the absurd were irrationalism, the absurdity of life, Okay, now the particularly the absurdity of life was portray, was uh, portrayed through the dramatic forms that would reject realistic settings. Okay, so this sense of absurdity which was felt by people uh, was represented in drama through certain kind of forms which would reject realistic settings. So, so even the stage setting then you would see uh, would not be realistic. You would not see you know. A proper, drawing, uh, a proper drawing room being represented or a proper scene being represented. It would be sometimes minimalistic, sometimes it would be, uh, you know, very unrelatable, okay. So, it would not be realistic, it would, it would not be something which you could relate to uh, in your everyday life. So, that would be the, uh, uh, you know, rejection of the realistic settings on stage. Um, there was also, uh, uh, you know, a rejection of the logical reasoning. So, sometimes even uh, you know what you what you what you see uh, going on in the uh, uh, absurd place. It seems to be uh, following no logic at times. You would see that oh, where is the logic, right? Where is the where is that connecting thread? So this this sense is deliberately woven into the way these plays are written, and uh, there was also a lot of times an absence of a coherently evolving plot. So usually, what you, uh, what you and I are used to are that there is going to be a plot which has a certain logic, it will move forward, it will evolve, it will go from one point to the other, uh, there's, uh, there will be some kind of a resolution towards the end, there will be some kind of a sense of finality towards the end, but all this was again thrown out of the window in the case of Theatre of the Absurd. So, there was no coherently evolving plot. So, what do we see over here? That there was an immense amount of experiment happening in uh, this style of writing okay so we have very clearly seen then so far that um, what were the uh, uh, what were the kinds of uh, uh, you know uh, experiences that people were going through at that time what were the reasons behind those experiences and how uh, did that impact uh, not not the uh, uh, not just the themes but even the form of the theater of the absurd right uh, now, you see, uh, Samuel Beckett, who uh, was of course an Irish, uh, who wrote in English, okay, is a very, very popular playwright associated with the Theatre of the Absurd. Then we have Harold Pinter, again in England, Tom Stoppard. Uh, these were some of the playwrights that were writing, um, uh, uh, you know, or that are associated with this movement of Theatre of the Absurd. Um, now, as we have been establishing all throughout, that uh, this was uh, a kind of a European phenomenon, right? Whatever was happening in the British drama um, had connections with whatever was happening in Europe uh, uh, as well. So, we see that uh, in this movement, which is uh, Theatre of the Absurd, the French playwright Jean Genet is also a lot of times mentioned. He is called as the master of uh, this kind of a playwriting. So, Jean Jenny is um, another one associated with the theatre of the absurd. Eugene Ionesco, whom we quoted in the beginning of the lecture, also uh, is associated with uh, the theatre of the absurd, right. So, we see that, um, you know, how this was a particular kind of uh, writing, dramatic writing that was being done in the 20th century. Uh, now, uh, I would like to uh, uh, just very really briefly talk about this play by Samuel Beckett, Waiting for Godot, okay. So that you, you, you get a sense of uh, what we have talked about regarding Theatre of the Absurd. Now, Waiting for Godot uh, is a play that was written in 1954, alright, and uh, it represents uh, two trams, okay. It presents uh, two trams uh, that were hopelessly waiting for an unidentified person called Godot who may or may not exist, okay. 
when if you look at the way this play is staged if you if you if you look at the images of uh, the staging of this play you will understand what i mean now you see uh, i'll just show you now on your, on, on your screen you you will see this picture uh, uh, of so, so so this is basically waiting for godot being performed on stage what do we uh, 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 see there are these two people uh and there's of course a third one uh, there's one is uh, and there there there's a tree behind uh uh one one person uh, you know has a rope which is connected to the other man and this man is carrying some luggage what do we see here minimalistic setting no props okay second why is this rope there and this is something very absurd as well isn't it and something also very kind of dark if we can call it that why will an individual be shown on stage to be connected to another man with a rope okay uh this sometimes you might not be able to make sense of okay so that's what we mean by absurd you see so even the stage setting defied any realistic um uh, uh, uh notions right uh the next picture if you see this one particularly uh uh you know is a is a quintessential representation of this play what do you see just a tree a tree which has no leaves okay it's not a usual tree that uh, that we would associate with it's not a green happy tree it's a tree with no leaves it's a sad looking tree just with branches we see two tramps sitting uh not even facing each other and just looking into the distance okay so what are they doing why uh, are they are, are they waiting for somebody it seems like they're just they're just sitting there uh, in a in a vacuum it's like so so there's a, uh, there's a kind of emptiness that you notice here even on the stage if you notice if you if you see on this uh, in this picture there are no props what does it indicate emptiness perhaps this could also then be a way of uh, the for the theater of the absurd to talk about this emptiness felt by human beings at this point of time when uh, you know the wars had caused such destruction in uh, across the world right so this gives you a sense that how would a uh, you know a play belonging to the absurd tradition uh, look at i mean look like on the stage right so uh, waiting for godo now coming back to waiting for godo um, So in so the, the, this was written in 1954, and it presents two tramps who are hopelessly waiting for this unidentified person, Godo, who may or may not exist. Okay, now nobody knows who is Godo. Even these people, they don't know who is Godo. As the reader, when you read, you don't know who Godo is, right? Uh, is it a person? Is it an animal? Is it who who Godo is? Nobody knows, right? And in fact, there's there's a large literary debate on it also some people say that that godo could be god right uh, godo could symbolize god because god who seems to be uh, non existent for the 20th century people it could be a representation of that godo then sometimes some people say could be representation of um, a sense of fulfillment or a sense of uh, happiness which also was kind of um, absent uh, at the time when you know wars had wreaked such havoc So what is Godo? Nobody knows, right? Uh, it's just this unidentified person who may or may not exist, okay? And this entire play is just about these two tramps who are waiting for Godo, and Godo never arrives. And that's all that this entire play is about. You will see them waiting. They do absurd things while they are waiting. Sometimes what they say even doesn't—I mean, doesn't even make sense. So I would really urge you to read this play to to you know understand what theater of the absurd exactly was doing. Uh now if you look at this quote from the play uh one of one of the tram says nothing happens nobody comes nobody goes it's awful. And this is a kind of a refrain. This this sentence uh, uh, keeps appearing uh, again and again in the play. Nothing happens nobody comes nobody goes it's awful. So there's a sense of stasis there's a sense of ennui. Nothing is happening. right it's awful okay so it's almost like representing the state of mind of people 
we also see uh, apart from this sense of nothingness this sense of uh, uh, emptiness etc this this play is also grotesquely comic there are parts of the play where you will see that um, uh, you know their their sad condition is being made fun of there are also instances of violence there are in fact references of violence not instances but sometimes would make you laugh but at the same time you see that they are incredibly sad you know so i uh, as i always uh, told you i mean as i just now told you that there's a very thin line between the comic and the tragic in the case of uh, theater of the absurd okay so what is oh, and and what does this indicate this is just a parody of assumptions of western culture right so this so this kind of a representation is is nothing but a parody of western culture where western culture felt that oh we are we have, we have, we have advanced so much but here it is you look at these plays you really wonder where is the advancement have we really progressed as mankind right so these questions come up when you read these plays right and also of course at the same time uh the conventions the traditional forms of drama also we see are very clearly questioned by theater of the absurd we don't see proper setting we don't see proper stage props we sometimes even don't see proper language it is broken right so all these um uh uh, uh you know features we also notice in waiting for godo and for that matter in other uh, theater uh, in the in the other plays belong to the theater of the absurd um now apart from this another kind of writing another kind of plays that we have during this time are the irish plays which, uh, which i was talking about in the beginning so the irish liter- literary theater is the other thing which we need to keep in mind when we talk about uh, drama in england uh why you might wonder that why are we thinking of irish because you see a lot of these plays were written in in english and um, and we do sometimes you know have at the back of our mind uh uh the the uh, the irish concerns as well when we are talking about the british ones right so the irish literary theater uh, by william butler yeats lady gregory and john millington singe was another aspect of the 20th century english drama okay these are some of the irish playwrights who were writing in english and uh, were associated with the irish literary theater now their purpose was to provide a specifically celtic and irish venue that produced um uh, works that staged the deeper emotions of ireland right now what do we see uh uh what what do we mean by celtic celtic was basically a particular uh, uh, you know kind of a, a, a belief a culture in ireland uh, which was native to that uh, place right so now the purpose of uh, these plays was to um was to uh, bring out the irishness to uh, to revive this kind of a uh, celtic culture which seemed to be on its um, uh, way out right now the playwrights uh, a lot of times um, this is also uh, uh, you know uh, called as the uh, irish literary uh, revival okay so um, uh, the playwrights of the irish literary theater then which later became the abbey theater as it is known today were part of uh, this literary revival that i just now uh, referred to now who were the playwrights sean o'casey was one j m singe was another uh, w b yeats lady gregory edward martin etc he said right so these were the people that were writing in this uh, trend and uh, if we very quickly look at uh, this term irish literary revival what do we mean that it it actually stimulated a new appreciation of traditional irish literature and irish poetry in the late 1920th century so this was a kind of a trend that we noticed in 1920th century uh, which was um, uh, you know uh, 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 which was uh, uh, noticed not just in drama but in poetry and in and in other uh, uh, forms of literary expression as well uh, whose interest then was uh, in the irish culture in uh, uh, you know ireland and its uh, ireland as a, as a as a country uh in reviving uh, all things irish right so these were the other kinds of plays that we notice in the 20th century as well right so in this lecture what have we seen we have noticed uh we 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 talked at length about the two dramatic forms first is the theater of ideas or the political theater um then we talked about the theater of the absurd we saw its conventions um its features its characteristics and then thirdly we uh, looked at um 
that how the Irish uh, plays as well are part of uh, are are important part of 20th century English drama, and uh, they are associated with this uh, uh, Irish movement that's called the Irish literary revival, which was um, which was uh, there in the 19th and the early 20th century. Right. So with this, you have an overview of um, of what exactly was the uh, uh, you know uh, uh, situation of trauma in England in 20th century. So in the further lectures, we will uh, take our discussion forward and perhaps even look at some of the particular texts from this time. Thank you.